climat se répète partout. La foule sort, se disperse. Reste deux femmes et un parapluie. Hello and welcome to another episode of Poetry to Your Ears. Today we are delighted to have uh, Simon Madrell on the show. Simon Madrell is a queer born Manx poet, thriving with HIV. Brought up in Bolton, Lancashire, he recently moved to Brighton and Hove after 20 years in London. Hello Simon. Hi there. <laughs> you want to start with reading the poem? Oh, just right, straight yeah, off. Yeah, straight right, in. <laughs> Pink and blue, blank sheet of paper, waiting for an informer's pink ink. Blue hounds sniffed out twenty queers, a three-day toilet flush in ninety-two sting. We're going for a cigarette. When we come back, we want a list. Names. Those known homosexuals. Or never see your family again. Three blue fingers point and tap, ringing the ears of your wife. The pavement spat, one car smoked, phones hated each other every night. When blue came back with three fags dead in their own hands, the blank sheet left. Excellent. We really love that poem. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And um, can you give us some quick background about uh, about it? Yeah, I mean, I I was I was born in the Isle of Man. I wasn't brought up there, but um, um, homosexuality in the Isle of Man was still illegal until 1992. Um, and actually, there's a there's a weird link in that the the assistant chief constable in Greater Manchester, which is where I was living, moved to the Isle of Man. And you might have heard of the very infamous James Anderson, who was um, a horrific homophobe and described um, described gay people as gay people with HIV AIDS as swirling in a cesspit of their own making, um, and offered to flog, homo- flog queers himself. And his assistant moved over to the Isle of Man and introduced a lot of very homophobic policies um, and when they realized that the law the tide had changed they decided to seek their revenge in that and this was in 1992 when they knew the law was changing they um, were basically hounding blackmailing um, and um, uh, gay people and, and and to a point which you know this poem outlines, really something that you would expect to see with the the Stasi in um, East Germany. Yeah, and so the, it was there was a weird kind of restriction to the Isle of Man as well. Yeah, so well, the Isle of Man isn't part of the United Kingdom. It's a crown protectorate, so it has its own government, its own parliament. Wow, fascinating. Yeah, so, wow, they, so they have their whole own culture there. That's, that's news to me, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and we're still... Um, um, this was a sequence of poems, and my, the third poem in that really talks about how um, I'm one of the key campaigners to to get an apology from the police, um, yeah. because last year, sorry, two years ago, there was a, a fantastic apology from the government at last for the for the anti-gay laws that were in place, um, but the one sort of flaw in the whole argument was that that um, they said that the police were only doing their job. And they damn well weren't only doing their job. They were targeting. And, you know, there's a... Um, um, I mean, I've written quite a, a whole series of poems. I've got another Manx pamphlet coming out next July, which is going to have a series of, of um, queer history poems in it. But... Um, you know, this was, um, it's never been illegal anywhere in the world to be homosexual. These police were th- blackmailing people to give them names of homosexuals. Now, now in, in 1992, in, 1990, in the 90s, it's incredible. In 1992. It seems, it seems like something from, uh, from, you know, from history from another century. It's, uh, I mean, it is from another century now, but, you know, 
in in the fifties, there was yeah. I mean, in the fifties yeah. in Earl's Court, there was um, um, quite famously um, three pretty policemen. They used to call the Beverly P- Sisters, who were used as as bait to to entrap homosexuals. Um, and in actual fact, in the Isle of Man, there was one young man from a place called Peel on the west of the island who was arrested every single time there was a sting at um, Nobles Park Toilets in Douglas. And for some reason, that person was never charged. Mm. They were always arrested and never charged. And the police refused to answer why. Now, let's just add two and two together. The pretty boy from Peel. And, and and this was the these were the tactics that that the tactics and policies that were used and it, it's um, um it, it's part of my argument that there's a fundamental difference between policies and practices and the specifics of law you know and the example I give t- to people is is well in the eighties were the police camping outside golf clubs rotary clubs. And the Masonic lodges at eleven or twelve o'clock, and stopping and breathalysing every car that came out, because they could have done, but they didn't. Now that might have saved some lives. Instead of the six to ten people who committed suicide, who took their own lives because of how they were treated by the police, what they were threatened with. And how do you use poetry? to talk about these subjects like what what is your process of writing um well it's interesting i've taken sort of different because 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 this poem when we were talking earlier about death and debts which is sort of conjuring up a very old custom that reminded me of 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 um i saw as a way into calling for a, 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 a police apology for, for mm. the debt that they owe gay people. Um, whereas more recently, I've tended to use some very specific stories, perhaps with a bit more lightness and humour to them, to shine a, shine a light on um, what you might perhaps say is the, the ridiculousness of... of, of, of the perspective that's been shown so you can sort of see that these two are sort of quite angry poems and but mm. i've sort of used my more recent um my more recent ones have sort of slightly taken a a, a, a different approach to the same and do you the use subject do you use poetry or these poems as part of your activism for uh apology from the police or is that separate in your understanding no, no, no. I mean, it's a it's it's a way of getting over the it's a way of getting over the um, um, the message. I mean, I am involved. Um, I've currently been asked by a, a member of the parliament to put a, a a sort of a one page argument together around around why the police should apologise, and also because because currently it was only the first ever public pride in the Isle of Man last year. It's the mm. first first anniversary of it, and the police weren't allowed to participate. And there's lots of people arguing that they should be allowed to officially participate. And our argument, and Alan Shea, who was the who was really the who is the um, the Manx gay activist, the man who made it happen, um, are both vehemently against allowing any f- official involvement in Pride until they apologise. Mm. Because by by allowing them to participate, you're basically saying it's OK. And yeah. it's not OK. And you say you, you describe yourself as a poet. You say you're a queer Manx poet. But you say you were born in the Isle of Man. Mm-hmm. But you grew up in, uh, where is it, uh, Lan- Lancashire. Yeah. And um, why... Are you so? Why do you feel so close to the Isle of Man? Well, on my father's side, our family goes back um, to sort of like the early sixteen hundreds, and 
as a child, we used to go um, back to the Isle of Man two or three times a year, um, probably, because my dad was a, a, a college lecturer. We, we had the summer off, so we would go to the Isle of Man for four weeks every summer, virtually every summer. Um, so I feel a very, very strong affinity, and for, for quite sad reasons, we never really had any contact with my mum's family, which is a bit of a story in itself, but so all of my familial connections are with are with the Isle of Man, um, and you know, so I was, was brought up in that in that environment. I feel Manx, I don't feel English, mm-hmm. so um, it's sort of that that's who I am. For the listeners, could you explain what Manx is? <laughs> oh, so well, Manx is the nationality of of the Isle of Man. Yeah, right. So it's not. A lot of people think I mean um, M A N C S Manx, as in from Manchester, but no, it's M um, A N X. Yeah. Mm. Is it? It's a language as well. It is Manx Gaelic, yeah, which I do use quite a lot in my poetry as well. Mm. Yeah, Are you so, fluent? In- no, no, no. I mean, it's a. I mean, it was almost a dead language. Um, like Cornish. Or- yeah, I mean it, but it's it's Cornish sort is still of been, spoken. But it's, it's been revived. There's now actually, a, well, it has been for a while a, um, a Manx only primary school. So they're taught in Manx Gaelic. Mm. Um, but um, so it's really, really got a massive revival. But it, 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 as a language, it almost, it almost died. But I, but I use a lot of, um, I use a lot of Manx words in in language. I mean, I think it's, it's very important. I mean, there are different, different views on this. But um, th- that on the one hand, wanting to preserve these um, smaller, lesser used languages is sort of a a, a preserve of privileged middle class and there can be an argument for that but on the other side of things for me language is so intrinsically um, entwined in culture that and there are some things that can only be said in a language and only have they, they can't be translated. Um, I mean, there's a... I can't remember what the word is. I'm going to find out again. But there's a, a single word in Manx, which is for when you get up in the morning and you look out into the field and the sun's just rising and there's that dew on the grass, there's an exact word for it. One mm. word for the the feeling or the the physical thing for the physical thing. Yeah. What's what's it? I called? I can't remember what it's called. Sorry, oh, okay. but um um, <laughs> I haven't brought it. Can't remember all of these things. Mm. Um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna look it back up again and um um, and use it. But it's an example of how it would be a word because it captured so much about the farming experience and what that meant to the whole day. You know, it says so, something about a culture that um, in, invests importance in that concept, in that idea, in that word. But, I, I yeah, yeah, because it means it means some, that 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 particular that particular type of weather or that particular thing in the morning means something to the whole of a farmer's day. So it has one single word mm. attached to it. Is it is it the way that you use it in your poetry? Is it to express words that don't have meaning in English, or is it to express uh, when you think in that language, or how do you balance between English and Manx Gaelic? Yeah, I mean, it's difficult. because I mean, a lot of the time it, it's using words, because a lot of folklore in the Isle of Man, so Munjaveggi, which technically means little people, is the name for um, what the English would call fairies. Um, um, so there are, um, there are a lot of folklore characters that have got a Manx Gaelic name. So I will use, I will use it in that sense. Um, there's another queer, um, queer protest poem that I call that's called um, Jerry which technically means God's tears, but it's the word for the f- the shrub fuchsia. Mm. You know the weepy, the weepy purple and red. Do you want to read flowers. it? Yeah, I can do. Um, it's quite. Um, 
Is it from any collection? Or no, it'll be in my next collection. Oh, okay. um, or my, so ne- my next pamphlet, which is which is out in... Just next. for the listener, Pink and Blue was from which collection? That was from Throat Bone, which was my first... Um, yeah, my, my, my first chapbook. And you have two other books. Um, you have Queer Fella. Yeah. That came out in 2020. Yeah, that won the Rialto um, pamphlet competition. Um, came out in December, July, December 2020. And the third one? The third one is a joint pamphlet with my two friends, Vasiliki Albedo and um, Mary Mulholland, which is um, nine poems each, all about our mothers, published by Nine Pens. Hmm. And uh, w- so, where can you get these? Um, throat bone is more difficult to get hold of, um, although you can buy it on the the dreaded Amazon place <laughs> that shouldn't be named. Um, they're probably best to get directly from me, or you can buy them from bookshops in the Isle of Man. Um, Nine Pens is available from Nine Pens website, and Rialto is available from the Rialto. And website. what's the name yeah. of your? Oh. Uh, no, not yet. People can get in contact with yeah, you. Yeah, I've, through... I'm on Facebook or Instagram. Oh, or, okay. Or, and Queer Manx Poet on Twitter. And what's the name of the the collection that's coming out soon? It's probably going to be called The Whole Island. Okay. It I doesn't a, have a definite name yet? Um, well, at the moment, that's the definite name, okay. unless they persuade me otherwise. <laughs> it, it, it includes a, um, quite a long poem, which is the central bit of the thing called the whole island which is sort of encapsulates my whole feelings and the ambivalence about yeah. about the isle of man so that's sort of the that's yeah, sort that of the, the foundation seems... stone of the mm. which is actually based on a um it was inspired by um a queer cuban poet called Virgilio pinero who wrote a poem a very very long poem called the whole island or it was, mm. um an ilsa pesa in 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 Spanish, but um, reading that poem inspired me to write to write a slightly shorter version. But this is um, Jerinyi, God's tears in Manx Gaelic, the fuchsia national shrub respected for its ever presence, but there is a real sorrow left in its weep. A hedge full of bees and memories at Grandpa's cottage. A cross-pollinating family now stuck together in a pot. Its cuttings spread keenly around the British Isles in red and purple, like the bishop's tunic in Sodor and Man. The red ran down his arms as he prayed for queer laws to stay put in our little island, thinking gay suicides were not shadows cast by his hands, are not a story about love, but instead a stained legacy. We all know it is. Manannan's tears that created a home for us. Yeah, so the end of that poem is um, um, Mananan is the um, the Lord of Man. Technically, it's a Celtic um, Celtic mythology, um, which is also Irish and Manx. And Mananan was the the son of the sea, um, the king of the underworld, and it was it was. One of the theories of the Isle of Man was that it was Manannan's tears that turned to land, and that's what formed the Isle of Man and why Manannan is the mm. is the Lord of Man. So that was the idea of of sort of using the the, the, the God's tears. Yeah. But um, I love the way you're using mythology to talk about queer lives on the Isle of Man because it's I feel you know the the divide between modernity and tradition and tradition comes with usually conservatism or when you want to you know talk about queer liberation usually it comes with modernity but you're kind of breaking that divide and you're saying no we're going to use the mythology and the the traditional imaginary of the culture but also uh 
promote or, or fight for queer liberation. I think it's it's a really, I don't know, I like the way you do it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm working on a poem at the moment, which is about um, the tr- a tradition on M- May Day's Eve to um, what they call burn the butch. And the word is spelt B-U-I-T-C-H-C with a cedilla. Mm. Um, so it looks like butch and bitch, mm. but actually also means witch. And you burn a gorse tree on your land to keep away the evil spirit. So, yeah, I mean, that is sort of, for me, that's a really interesting thing to to explore that the... Um, you know the the words butch and butch lesbian and a lot that you know like Joel Taylor talks about in in um, um, I don't know if I can say the word but um, C U N T O um, um, how she uses that but also the the um, yeah so that's one of the things I'm going to be exploring I've not worked out exactly how to do it yet but exploring that whole idea of of um, you know queerness and difference I mean you know yeah. which is where um, witches were put in a barrel with nails and rolled down a hill and of course you know the, the usual story if they survived they were a witch they get yeah. um, you know and, and that was that was that was demonising difference so it's exactly the same you know the mm. the um, usually white straight men feeling feeling threatened by a power that they don't understand um, and that's what you know. That that, that that's where the mm. the, the demonization of witches you, came from. Do you get a lot of, of inspiration from existing poems or poets? Yeah, no, sure. I mean, I do write. Um, um, I do write some um, some poetry really inspired by that. I mean, particularly the one that springs to mind is is Dana Smith. Um, the American poet. Um, I mean, they're non-binary, black African American, HIV positive. So there is. Is it the one who wrote who wrote the poem C C U N T? Or no, that was someone else. No, Joel Taylor wrote oh. um, the whole book called oh. Kunto, and there's a there's a um, um, a series. She's um, she's a lesbian poet. She just won the T.S. Eliot Prize this year. Um, a wonderful woman. Um, so Dana Smith, yeah, I, I, I really love their poetry. They wrote um, an amazing poem called Dear White America, and Ray Antrobus wrote a version called Dear Hearing World. He's a poet who happens to be deaf, so that was, that was his perspective. Um, so... I decided to write D- Dear Straight World. Um, mm. In Danez's recent um, collection, they wrote a poem called the F- called Fall Poem, um, which was um, using the analogy of of the fall, as in autumn, um, to talk about the loss of black bodies. But as soon as I read it, I just saw how um, the same analogy could be could could be used for gay shame. Mm. So I wrote a poem mm. driven by that. But um, at other times, you you, you um, I I probably don't read anywhere near eno- as much as I should. Well, I know I don't read as much as I should. But a lot of the time, you might get those two Danes examples of me using pretty much the skeleton of what they've done to put my own version on top of it yeah. whereas in other instances you just might you just might be inspired by an idea that they talk of or inspired by a line or inspired by the technique that they use mm. rather than particularly the content mm. um and yeah and, and use that to use that to to write something, I, mean, I don't think you can. I don't think you you can become um, 
better at anything in the arts without submerging yourself in the arts. Mm. Um, I mean, I get a lot of inspiration from um, uh, from physical art. I get a lot of inspiration from films um, as well. Um, there's so much poetry in, 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 in many films and there's so much... Um, so much to be inspired by in in, in art as well mm. um but i think you know i don't think there's a i don't think there's a successful artist anywhere who who doesn't um doesn't say the way in which the, the way in which they get artists inspired. improve is, is is by submerging themselves in other you know there's that famous quote originally it was T.S. Eliot said it, Picasso said it later, and there's arguments about where it originally came from, but, um, um, you know, good artist copy and great artist steal, you know, mm. or something to that effect. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a concept in poetry as well, isn't there? Something like um, the anxiety of influence. Um, it's I think it's along the lines of, of, it's almost like a negative approach to that, rather than embracing that everything is influenced it's more of this kind of fear that you're channeling something else all the time that you know nothing you're doing is particularly original original you're kind of channeling all different uh, uh works from the past you know like like sort of uh, Auden's poetry achieves nothing um <laughs> um yeah, I don't know about that concept, but um, yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not 100 percent familiar with that concept as well. But I, from what I understand, it's, it, it's just this idea that uh, uh, kind of artists and I think poets particularly are kind of, um, they kind of bedeviled by it. They're kind of um, haunted by this, this idea that uh, they're, they're, they're not, you know, doing something original. There, there is this um, influence all the time. Well, I mean, I think, I, I, I mean, I, it doesn't sound very healthy to me. I mean, I yeah. think... Um, I mean, that's, I, a, that's a negative way of looking at it. I think a, a positive way is to embrace the influence and say, you know, we're... I think you know whether you're doing something unique or not, as opposed to just imitating. And and, and if, you've, if, you, if, if, if you think that you're imitating then stop and that will stop you being anxious because regardless regardless of the degree to which you um put your own stamp on a on um on someone else's structure or paint a, paint a different version of the of someone else's painting i mean one of one of um Van Gogh's most famous paintings, the the gel yard in, um, um, in Reading, with the circling prisoners, he copied from another. He copied from a photograph. Well, that painting's far more famous and far better than the painting that it was originally taken from. Yeah. Um, and you know, so I mean, I don't. Um, from one perspective, philosophically. There is nothing new, so what's the point about getting anxious about the fact that anything you think or feel or say is not new? Mm. Um, what potentially is new is that different people will hear that same thing in a different way and be moved by it. Mm. Um, and. From that perspective, um, something that I, is what you're trying to achieve. You something know? I, I get from your poetry or what I receive and that I really love is that I feel like you're really inspired by history, queer history and the social context in, in, of your own life, but also of uh, Greater Britain. Do you, would you say that's, that this is where you write from? Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think it's impossible to be um, authentic unless you write from yourself. Even if e even if you happen to be a much more ambiguous or surreal 
poet, you're still it's still coming from oneself. You know, I'm not I'm not a I'm not a great I'm not a great fan of this idea that somewhere in the somewhere in the ether there's this poetic god that we have a connection to that comes down and writes poems through us you, you don't believe yourself to be an instrument of the universe no <laughs> um, that's a very uh, sp- a specific answer no um but i do believe that i'm part of the universe right and that that i'm part of a universal energy that exists within the universe so i do write quite a lot about um um what you might call eco poetry and about um mm species extinction and all of those sorts of things because of um, um, trying to put across our connection to mm. something greater. So, um, Do you have a, a poem to read from uh, related to nature? Oh, I've got lots of poems about nature. Um, mm. Even a stone has a soft spot, a worn through a hole after years of attrition. Like a heart whose emptiness is its strength, as in how a mill grinds wheat and a cup fills up, and how their threaded weight makes looms and fishing nets complete. As in how you find it yourself, because not everything can be bought or stolen, or ridden hard by witches on Sabbath's eve. And if by chance you don't believe in hexes, Hold one stone with one hole in one hand and notice if your eye resists a telling stare drawn through by its own event horizon like your heart pulls in your dark blood then blows out bright. Mm. So like it does a nice link with our previous episode with uh, Sprigs of Heather who writes a lot about witches and spirituality and, and the and the nature the influence of nature so. that, so, was, that was masterful that poem thank you <laughs> that, what was it called even a stone has a soft spot very often my um mm. my titles are the first line of the poem yeah is, um, it, is this one of is this one of your favorite poems would you say I mean, um, how, how many poems have you written would you say if you had to guess about 200 in three years yeah um there's there's this has actually um very recently been published in a um a great magazine called finnish creatures it's um i mean what what's inspired it is i'm um um enormous fan of Derek jarman um and when I moved to Brighton just before lockdown, I was very fortunate to um, have a small garden in my uh, flat, which was a terrible mess. And I basically, during lockdown, built this new garden um, and was very inspired in my thinking by what Derek Jarman did in Dungeness. Um, if you look at me as though you don't know who Derek Jarman is, who is a... Um, He's a a poet, writer, filmmaker, director, artist, um, who was one of the first people in the UK to publicly declare they were HIV positive in 1986. Um, and he died in 1994. Very soon after he was diagnosed with HIV, he moved and bought a cottage called Prospect Cottage in Dungeness, which is the driest place in England, shingle beaches um and he wrote um a memoir called modern nature and a posthumous posthumous one called um smiling in slow motion um and from there he made a series of films and he built this garden out of nothing um Mm -hmm. and one of the things he did was to collect um hex stones witch stones snake stones whatever you want to call them those stones with a hole in them that have had a hole worn out in the middle um, and he um, um, he collected um, he collected these stones um, and made rings out of them for hanging. He would put 
put the stones onto sticks and stuff. And during lockdown, I was doing that a lot, walking along the beaches and collecting. I have got so I've mm. got hundreds of these stones hung in rings or lines. Or we want to see pictures. <laughs> <laughs> I can show you afterwards. It would take me too long to. Um... We, we put them on the Instagram. <laughs> yeah, I mean that you can see you can see them all on my um, Instagram. But I mean, there's a. Here's a very short poem that you see that you get inspired by things in nature mm. that you see and how that can evoke different memories. One thing I've learned with poetry is that the the, the beauty and specifics. Um, it's very easy to, to think that you need to write generically in order to create a universal appeal. But in actual fact, the, the 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 real truth is is um, is is very very different than that. I'm just trying to find a a quote from um, um, William Blake, who who talked about the holiness of minute particulars. Mm. Um, the holiness of minute particulars, and that. Um, um, yeah, it was my it was um, my friend friend Rob Hamburger, who's a who's a Brighton based poet, that that told me about that. But I mean, it's a great I think it's a great example of of how it's through the very specifics of poetry that you can talk to you can talk to something bigger through that, and it's sort of in many senses the definition of a. The definition of an ode is 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 that you know is to focus on a particular something very specific, but that 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 bigger thing either gives you a route into into exploring something bigger, or that those specifics provide symbols for for something larger that that people can see or feel for themselves. How did you find poetry in the first place? How did you start writing poetry? Whew. Um, it took me um, 35 years, I think, to realise that that's what I was. When I did um, um, poetry at school, we studied a book called Nine Modern Poets, which I, I managed to actually find. Um, and um, I absolutely fell in love with particularly Wilfred Owen. There was Owen and Auden, um, Dylan Thomas, R.S. Thomas, um, um, were in there, um, and I love. I fell in love particularly with um, with Wilfred Owen, and then went myself to read lots of the other war poets, um, Sassoon in particular, um, and then some of the Romantics like Rossetti and such like. But my English teacher told me I was I was absolutely useless, <laughs> um, and it's a bit hard to describe in those days. Um, poetry just seemed. I just went to a state. It was a grammar state grammar school. Um, but poetry just seemed to be something that dead people used to do, mm. and and. You know, any idea that um, one could become a poet oneself was just a complete anathema. Um, we didn't write poetry at school, um, and of course, what we did, which was, which was, again, in many senses, the antithesis of of real poetry, was that we were taught to analyse it and to 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 get the correct interpretation mm. of what the of what the poet was saying, you know, and and that um, 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 it wasn't valuing creativity in the the students themselves. It was more about no, it was instilling us with awe, mm. and unfortunately, look at um, this great art that you can't. That you can't touch. 
I think this is... <laughs> and, and, denying, and denying us the truth that Wilfred Owen was gay, that Sassoon was gay, that WH Auden was gay. Mm. My life would have been completely different if I'd known that. Mm. Completely different. When did you... When did you know they were gay? Oh, many years later. Did Do that influence you in writing poetry yourself? Um, well, it certainly influenced my... Um, my interest in Wilfred Owen. I mean, I wrote, a, as part of the Brighton Festival, a, a commission, I wrote a... Um, um, a very long poem, which was sort of inspired by... Um, um, the Lamentations of Jeremiah um, but it was called Anthem um, Lament for Doomed Youth and quite a lot of what I use in it is, is segments of of Wilfred Owen but, but to talk about talk about the doomed youth of a young a young queer man so it sort of covers 50 years of the 50 years of my life really um yeah so so recently you performed at the brighton fringe festival as part of it yeah you performed your show queer fella no the show was um yeah. two old queens and a, a clutch of poems oh the book is queer fella this is what well, this was with friends that you did it sorry you did the show with someone else as well yeah with rob hamburger yeah yeah. yeah, and we actually, funny enough, we actually had tickets to it, but we to totally we messed up the, the timing. Time yeah. And it was, we so you, sorry you weren't the only this. one. <laughs> 6 p.m. was so early. Uh, and we weren't yeah, because it. we had to cancel it, because of, because I got COVID, we had mm. to postpone it. We all, we were stuck with whatever slots they had. Yeah. They had mm. free. We are seriously considering bringing it back in um, August Pride Month. We for, would love to. For one show. Yeah, yeah. we definitely, so, we'd love to come to that one. Um, can, can you kind of give us just a rough idea of what the format of the show was? You know, how many poems you did, it, um, what the, yeah, how? Yeah, sure, how it, was a, miss? it was, um, I think, a unique idea because I, I've certainly not seen it before. So the premise of the, um, the premise of the show is that basically as an audience, you're watching two people sat in a pub at a pub table with a pint, having a chat. So you're sort of the voyeurs, eardrop, mm. e eavesdropping on this conversation that happens. Um, and that every now and then, the conversation stops with one of the poets getting up, the table goes dark, and one of the poets stands under a spotlight and reads a poem. Mm. And then they go back to their seat and the, and the conversation continues as though nothing's happened. Um, so whilst there's a connection, and this happens all the way through, so Rob's on one side of the stage, I'm on the other, um, and every now and then the, the, the chat is interrupted by one of us standing up and, um, and, and reading a poem. So that, that bit, if you like, is the, the fourth wall where the, where the, the audience is... It's just being talked to by that one single poet. The other poet doesn't exist, mm. um, and then the conversation, the conversation continues. And I think if you if if you did the the timings of it, it would end up that about a third of it is chat, a third of it is Rob s saying poems, and a third of it is 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 me, roughly speaking. And is the is the chat in between? Is that improvised or is that written? Um, so the um, it, it, a mixture of the two. I mean the the segues in and out of the poems are sort of scripted to to make that to make that work. Yeah. And then we've just got a rough idea of what we're going to talk about. Yeah. In between, but it has to be controlled a little bit because otherwise you just you just end up running massively over yeah. time. So we but we don't actually have a exact script to it. So I'm told that it. That it does feel, it does feel like you're eavesdropping on this on this this sort of um, mm. um, 
yeah, this conversation between two people. And so how did you find that whole experience of performing it at multiple dates? And we loved it. Um, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it took me a while to persuade Rob that it would work. But but certainly the cause I, I I didn't want to I didn't want to do something. Nothing drives me more mad than explaining poems and then reading them. Mm. Um, so I wanted to sort of completely separate the two. But of course the poems, um, the poems are driven from the conversation, but that's for the audience to piece together so in, so in the, the conversation we never make any reference to the poems that we've read if, if you actually cut all the poems out you would have a 20 25 minute pub conversation that would still stand on its own if that makes sense mm. in the description you say that you explore growing up sex love creativity and hiv aids how what how was the flow of the conversation did you go from one subject to another or was it just yeah, we did really. I mean, the the um, um, yeah. I mean, it starts off talking about fathers, um, and our very different relationships to that. And Rob is a father himself too, um, and and then growing up, growing up queer. Um, but HIV and creativity was sort of all is quite intermingled because we talk about um, we talk about a very close friend of Rob's who um, who died of AIDS related illness and was also used creativity and we talk a lot about about Jarman in the same way and and how that links also into into using art as protest which is something that Jarman did very much did as well both through his films and through his 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 paintings so um um yeah i mean i'm told it's a great show so if we do do it in in august you definitely yeah, you definitely must come along yeah. <laughs> it's certainly a different it certainly wouldn't have seen a a poetry show like it mm. you, you didn't manage to record it in any way no we sort of didn't want to because yeah. we sort of um i mean we've pitched it also to albra Albra Poetry Festival as well, so we'll see if that if if that comes off. Do you know when that um, is when that runs? Oh, that runs in November. We'll we'll find out next month whether we whether we've mm. been accepted or not. But I say we we're, we're seriously considering um, doing another one in Brighton in in August. Yeah, it sounds like a great concept. Yeah. yeah. And when are you performing next? Um. I've got. Um, I'm featuring at Flight of the Dragonfly on July the twelfth, um, which is at the no the pub that's right next to oh, the, the station. Don't know the name. Um, anyway, that's July the twelfth yeah. with Flight of the Dragonfly, so I'm featuring there. Um, I'm um, I think featuring with Words on the Water probably in July as well. Well, oh, I definitely nice. am featuring with them, but. The plan, I think, at the moment is is that's going to be July the twenty seventh, and I'll be appearing at the um, the open mic for Queer the Mic. Mm. All in July then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and um, um, and actually also on July the July the seventh, I'm featuring at in London at um, a show called Bold, um, which appears at the above the Stag Queer Theatre. Mm. Um, in London, so I'm one of the feature artists at that too. So I've got a, got a busy July. Yeah, well, we'll be sure to share your events away on the on the Instagram. And where can we find you? Yeah, you can find me at um, um, Simon Madrill on Instagram and on Facebook. Simon Madrill Poetry on Facebook, and Queer Manx Poet on Twitter. And to buy your books is uh, send your message. Yeah, yeah, you're best to... I mean, you you can find them all online, but, um, um, but yeah, you can you can contact me through social media, queermanxpoet at bcinternet.com or, or through any of the social medias. I can, I can help you out with that. 
Great. It's beautiful. Thank you so much for talking to us today. It's been yeah, really enlightening. Great. And we're excited to see you perform again. Yeah. And um, if you're listening to the show, come see Simon perform next. <laughs> Thank you for listening, guys. Thank you. See you next time. Je regarde de l'autre côté de la rue. Mon regard est accroché par deux femmes qui discutent sous la pluie. Je dois être excité. Oui, mais il faut dissimuler. Je dois attendre qu'elles se séparent.